All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Uh, welcome to the virtual reading group uh, where we are making our way through, uh, you know, Hannah Arendt's uh, most important book of political theory, um, uh, The Human Condition or the Vita Activa um, in German. Um, and it actually was her original title in English as well. Uh, just, uh, you know, we're in the middle of this chapter on labor, and um, I think it's easy to get bogged down uh, to some degree uh, for people to sort of lose sight of the big picture. Uh, so what's the book about? Um, the human condition uh, is about thinking what we are doing um, uh, in light of our newest experiences and fears. Um, and uh, uh, above all, I, I say this with some trepidation, but I'll, I'll say it, above all, um, the newest experience and fear that Arendt is, is, is exploring and, and identifying in this book is the, um, on the one hand, the elevation of the Vita Activa to a place of uh, uh, aggrandizement over the Vita Contempliva. And that's important. But I think even more important is the then elevation within the Vita Activa of um, the animal laborans, the laboring animal, over and above uh, the um, acting uh, animal. All of this is part of what I take to be the core idea of the human condition, the book, the Vita Activa, which is that we are in danger of losing the public realm and a common world. That's what the book's about. The book, you know, all the stuff about Greece that people are, you know, asking about and why do we love Greece? And what, you know, she doesn't love Greece. She doesn't want to go back to Greece. She certainly, while she loves Plato and Aristotle in a certain way, she thinks they're wrong. She thinks they're, they're one of the causes of all our problems. What is it that she loves about Greece? What are the pearls that she dives for back into Greece and pulls out? Well, above all, it's, the, it's a word, one word, polis. It's the word for politics. It's the word that says that politics is about a space, is about a world, a, a humanly created common world that we share. And she's worried that we are losing this idea of a common world, of a political world. The chapter we're reading now on labor, which we're in the middle of, um, is about the rise, the glorification of the animal laborans, this, this laboring animal. And this laboring animal um, is an animal whose focus is not on politics, right? So if you remember in, in her book, the origins of totalitarianism. She one of the one of the many elements of the rise of totalitarianism for Arendt is the rise of the bourgeoisie into politics. The bourgeoisie, which is a class that cares about what M making money, having a business, having a family, my private social life, separate from politics. She says this bourgeoisie enters politics in the late nineteenth century not because they care about the public realm, not because they care about the, the, the political sphere, but because they wanna make more money and they want to capture the violent and powerful institutions of government to support capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, and slavery insofar as they will then be able to make more money. 
And so the, the rise of the bourgeoisie into politics is again, part of this story of the loss of the polis, of the common, of this political world. In this book, in this chapter on labor, she's telling a similar story. She's telling a story of how um, labor, which she distinguishes from work, you know, in this very innovative way. Why is that distinction so important? Because work, insofar as when we work, we make things, things that last, things like a book that we can all talk about and read together. That is part of making a world. It's making a common world. But when we labor, we are simply producing things, not things, we're producing processes and, and then things that will be consumed and lost that don't last, that are not part of the common world. And so this, this, this anima laborans, which is now being elevated, which the whole premise of the human condition is this anima laborans, which for centuries was seen as almost inhuman, is now being elevated to the highest uh, activity of mankind, um, uh, is not going to humanize nature, but naturalize mankind. Man is gonna be naturalized and mechanized. And that is the new experience that Arendt is trying to point to uh, in this chapter on labor. We are, um, uh, reading uh, in the middle of the chapter, uh, chapter uh, sections 14 and 15. Um, and, and the first one is called labor and fertility. Um, the, key to un the key to understanding the labor and fertility chapter is fairly simple. It's an equation. I can just tell you it is life equals labor equals happiness. Labor is being glorified from the lowest rank of the Vita Activa to the highest rank, namely as happiness and as life. Labor is glorified as life and as happiness. And, you know, she goes through this, you know, the Bible saw labor as a curse or a punishment for Adam and Eve's disobedience. The Greeks saw labor as something that uh, was stood against our realization as political beings that was confined for women and slaves and to some extent children. Politics was free from labor. Marx, however, right? And this is, remember the whole point of this chapter is she says that sadly, she's gonna critique Marx even though he's brilliant. She thinks Marx saw this with a clarity that no one else did, but that there's contradictions that he, she says run right through him. She, Marx seeks to free us, not as citizens, not as political beings, but as private persons or men. Marx is thus, in her view, on the one hand, um, uh, sees, and yet is also partly responsible for the loss of politics in the modern world, the transformation, the replacement of politics and of the public realm with um, concern with, with economics, capital, and labor. Um, Marx, on the one hand, will say that labor is, quote, the supreme world-building capacity of man, right? We, in labor, we build the human world. That's why man is an animal laborans, a laboring animal. At the same time, Marx will see that in laboring and in working in a factory, man is dehumanized and alienated. On the one hand, Max, Marx will see um, that there is a glorification of labor, that you know, labor is what frees us. On the other hand, uh, and, and, but, but labor, he'll say, is a violent and necessary bodily process. On the other hand, he's obsessed with freedom. Um, the point is that these are fundamental contradictions, she says, that run through Marx's work. On the one hand, um, labor is eternal, is an eternal necessity and is productive and leads to life. On the other hand, must, man must free himself from labor. Uh, and so these are the contradictions uh, 
that Arendt um, sees in, 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 in Marx. And then she asks the question on page 105, right? Why does the modern age glorify labor? Right? It's a simple question. Um, why is it that in the modern age, labor, which for so long, for hundreds, thousands of years, has been seen as a curse and, a, and, 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 and something to be avoided, is suddenly glorified? And her answer is that we glorify and value labor because we have come to idealize life and happiness, right? Instead of um, politics, which seeks uh, greatness or, or courage or uh, lasting things, um, daringness, uh, justice, uh, we now glorify happiness and life. And um, the fertility of labor, right? The fact that labor is fertile, that it generates things, generates money, generates goods, generates food, makes our life comfortable, um, makes us the most happy and the most alive. And so the blessing or joy of labor, she'll say on, one or se in, on page 107, um, uh, is that it's labor is the human way to experience the sheer bliss of being alive, which we share with all living creatures, both in the activity of laboring, where we feel our al aliveness, but also in that in laboring, we create the goods that make us happy and comfortable. So the blessing of labor, is she says on page 107 to 108, is that effort and gratification follow each other, right? This is something she says a lot. And, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a deep phenomenological claim on her point that you want to work or labor and then relax and enjoy. Labor and then relax and enjoy. Um, and so uh, they follow each other. And thus happiness is actually part of the laboring process. Even though laboring is hard, it leads to, I'm going to enjoy my, you know, creme brulee or my iPhone, and, uh, and there I'll, I'll be happy. Um, and that's the fundamental reality, she says on, on 108, of a laboring humanity is the happiness of the great, greatest number is now our societal ideal. Um, you know, Samuel Moyne, political thinker today, historian, you know, who's written a lot about human rights, I think get something really right when he says that the, the turn to human rights in the modern age is part and parcel of the loss of all other grand ideals. It's, he calls it the last utopia. Well, we keep people alive because we don't have, we don't know what else really where we ain't, we, we, that is our purpose or meaning in life. And, and this is very much Arendt's view is that labor has become associated with life and happiness, uh, and it's replaced the higher ideals, um, uh, whether they be uh, justice or, 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 or greatness or religion or, or community, whatever it is. Um, and so the, 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 the sort of the, the conclusion of this chapter is that happiness equals life and is brought about by labor, and that labor is, the, is this is the is what is how we pursue the life force of fertility um, in in our lives. Um, the second chapter we read today on privacy and property and wealth is what it's called in English. This is one of those places where, especially the first couple sentences of this paragraph, this chapter, I don't think you can understand if you don't have the German text in front of you. Um, it's funny, it, it boggled my mind for many years until I read the book in German. The, the chapter title in German is quite different. Um, it's the Abschaffung des Toten, Eigentums zugunsten der lebendigen Aneigung. Um, Aneigung. So it's the, the destruction of the dead property in favor of the living appropriation. Um, and if you understand, you know, which is a much more uh, helpful title than privacy of property and wealth. Um, uh, the point is, uh, and you can get this from the first sentence in the German, that's not, a, that's not exactly explained at all in a clear way in English, 
is that um, uh, the theory of labor uh, as a justification for property, namely Locke's theory that labor is a justification uh, for property, um, uh, ends with Marx's theory of labor, which is an, abo an abolition of private property. Right? So the theory of labor in the modern age starts with the justification of property and ends with an abolition of property. And, and, and why is that? Um, her argument is that um, the modern defense of property as it started in Locke and went through Smith and into Marx overall is actually not a defense of private property. It's not a defense of property against state appropriation. And she says, that's sort of obvious because really until Marxism, there was no real danger of state appropriation of private property. It was pretty much safe. So it's not likely that Locke and others would have defended uh, private property as um, uh, something to be defended against the state. She says, uh, instead, um, the, what was defended in the original theories of property was not property, but the unhampered pursuit of more property or what she calls appropriation. So um, now I think you can start to see the meaning of the German title, which is the destruction of dead property in favor of living appropriation, dead and living in quotes, just so you know. Um, so this pursuit of appropriation um, is, she says, which is what the theory of property really was, this defense of and justification for not property, but for acquiring ever more property. Um, in the, is fought, she says, and here's the, the core argument, in the name of society over and against the common world, right? So what we're defending is, the, is my right as a bourgeois to acquire in an unhampered way as much property as I can, not um, so that it will contribute to the public world, not that it will even be an actual thing like a house or an estate or, a, you know, whatever it is, but that it's money or it's, it's wealth for my own benefit as a social person and as a private person, not as a public person. Um, and so uh, this is the, this is that first distinction that we're, we're, we, we, there's that originally property was, this is the right to acquire and it was against the public world. Um, she then wants to say that labor, um, which is about pursuing our wants and life and thus uh, our, our, our appropriation, does not actually seek to acquire property or in the sense of dead property, but it seeks to acquire um, wealth and thus the life, which she calls on page 110, the life of society. And then she goes into this long distinction that life is located in the body and labor insofar as it seeks to produce life um, is a bodily activity. And uh, it's, it's bodily activity because you actually have to use your hands and, and work, you know, and, and, and body. Um, and uh, it is therefore uh, not public and is quite private. Um, uh, the modern age, she says, thus the modern age socializes property, it transforms property into this idea of appropriation. Um, and that is not what private property originally meant. Thus, uh, insofar as the modern age uh, privatizes and bought of, and makes labor part of the body, it ejects one radically from the common world and imprisons one in the body, uh, in the labor of one's body and the work of one's hands. Um, uh, in this way, um, modern labor uh, um, turns man into uh, a laborer. Uh, it, it naturalizes man. Um, mo this modern living property uh, is world escaping, right? It's a happiness and isolation from the world in my bourgeois hedonistic existence. And it's 
And uh, she talks about a release from pain and things of that sort. Um, if this property of, as appropriation has its origins in labor and the modern labor theory, she says that Locke's theory still was pre-modern insofar as it actually dealt with dead property. Dead property in the sense of things that, that, that are in the world and visible in the world and build a world. And um, it provides a, a place of respite, uh, but was still partly connected to a worldly idea of property. Um, and then that she, she ends this chapter, uh, this section with this, what she calls this big shift on page 117, um, where we shift from property to uh, dead property to uh, living appropriation and wealth and the process of accumulation as such. Um, she says at the very end that neither abundance of goods, you know, if we make a lot of goods, nor the shortening of the time actually spent in laboring are likely to result in the establishment of a common world. And so this laboring, this fertile labor towards appropriation rather than property um, is, again, tearing us away from a common world and imprisoning us within a world of our private lives. Um, and then she ends this with the sense that as we um, continually wither away the public and common, to the extent we have free time, um, we spend it in one of two ways, in laboring and thus creating more to consume more, to consume more, to labor, to consume, or in hobbies, worldless activities. You know, we paint or we, 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 we whatever it is, but we're not engaged in a public activity um, and, in, uh, and, and concerned with uh, the public world. We're engaged with ourselves in these hobbies. Um, when we read the chapter on art uh, uh, at the very, at the end of the work section, she'll worry that art, which is the most worldly of uh, the bodily activities um, is even becoming a hobby for most artists instead of uh, something that matters in the world. But um, we'll get there, uh, that's still a few months away. So that's a, a, a short, I hope, short introduction into these two chapters. There, I, I think the chapter, especially the, the chapter 15 on, on, on dead and living property is quite complicated. Um, so I imagine there may be some questions for it. As I said, when I first read it in English, the first three or four times I probably read it, I had a hard time with it. It wasn't until I read the German that I was able to actually make sense of it. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll see what we can do. Um, Susan, you're, you're, you're up first. Yeah. Hi, Roger. So yep. thank you. Um, so first I want to say, I was a little scared when you started because your intro, your immediate introduction was what I expressed in my small group last night, which is sometimes I feel like I'm so in the weeds with a rent that I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Once in a while I step back and I say, Oh, wait a minute. What, what the hell are we talking about here? So, <laughs> cause I get so pulled in by her and, and it's a wonderful thing. But so here's my uh, question and maybe a couple comments. My first question is I'm still, uh, pardon the pun, I'm still laboring with the idea of her differentiation between labor and work. I get it in a purely definitional level that she's talking about, but I guess I'm not understanding the significance or the importance of it. That's number one. And then the second thing is, and this is more of a comment about labor. I, I, and this may be a misreading or a misinterpretation of mine, or I haven't gone far enough in her readings, but sometimes I feel like she is, um, maybe not has the right balance on labor. Labor, and not work, because I get the difference, but labor in and of itself, and this is a 21st century perspective from a woman who worked in uh, corporate technology America for you know 40 plus years. God, I loved labor. I loved the physicality 
of when I did my gardens or when I created something out of wood and it wasn't for sale and it wasn't for purchase, but yeah, it was very, it was physicality. There was a great deal of pleasure in it. And did I offer it to the world? Yeah, no, but in some individual sense, there is an offering to the world in terms of creating gardens or woodwork or whatever you do. I, so that is more of a comment and I haven't flushed it through. So I guess, you know, my first question is the importance of her distinction between labor and work. Why is that important in her work? And then just my comment about labor overall that maybe for us in the 21st century and our um, intellectual approach to many things, it's not such a bad thing to maintain a connection to our very maybe primitive being. And, and maybe we've lost that a little bit. So I don't know, You're, I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Great, thanks, Susan. So on, on the first one on sort of the laboring of the idea of labor and work and their significance, I mean, you know, it comes, it comes down to, uh, I think this question of the public world versus the social world um, for her. Uh, um, what work produces things, things that last. They can be silly things like, you know, a nice fountain pen or a book. You know, I mean, this pen is sort of disposable. I don't usually use these, but it's what's in front of me. Um, but they, uh, work produces things and at the, and at, and the best work creates the best things, right? I'm, it's just how she thinks. Uh, and those works are works that people talk about and will preserve and last and perform over and again and read over and again. And they will become part of our common world that those that in between that holds us together. Um, and thus work is part of the politics in the sense that it's the part of, you know, work has an active component as a public component that it builds a public world. And, um, and, and, and insofar as it does, uh, you know, it, 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 it pulls us out of our kind of solipsism and, and, and our, and our, and our, you know, confinement to our bourgeois social uh, happiness. Um, labor, uh, she thinks does not, um, mm. uh, and, and labor, uh, uh, appeals to, um, consumption. Uh, now this is going to run into your second comment or question, and I'm going to lay, and I'm going to sort of talk about them now at once. When you said she doesn't give enough, maybe credibility to labor or importance to labor or uh, however you want to put it. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I would say, first of all, I think she does. Um, you know, she says labor is one of the three core activities of the human condition. Mm -hmm. uh, and she thinks that people who own slaves or have people work for them and don't labor are in some way also missing out on what it means to be human. Um, interestingly enough, you gave two examples of labor, the physicality of labor, your garden and your woodwork neither of which she would call labor, right? Oh. She would call those um, hobbies. I mean, assume, you know, because I'm, I'm assuming what you said is you worked in corporate technology and you did gardening and woodwork. I assume that was not what you did in order to pay your bills. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, no, I, no, I agree. You're right about that. But that, but, 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 but she kind of, and again, maybe this is my misinterpretation of it, but it sounds like to me, she's kind of like saying, she's kind of putting that down. Like, oh, they're just hobbies. It's not really significant. It's not that she's not putting it down. <laughs> what she's saying is, and this again, will come back in the in the last chapter, last okay. section of this chapter, and also in the, in the arts work of art chapter at the end of oh, work. Okay. But what she's saying is that what Marx had hoped right, mm. is that when we got more productive with our labor power and we had leisure time or free time, you know, we would be free. And 
the kind of freedom which we've ended up with, she's saying, is not political freedom, is not a freedom in which we engage in the world with others. It's where we sit by ourselves and garden or paint. Yeah, yeah. And, and we develop ourselves and maybe make ourselves more interesting so we can go to parties and talk about ourselves or, you know, or, you know have a nice, interesting life. But we have, um, we have not re-engaged with what she considers to be freedom as a public and political and active uh, uh, activity, which is how she understands freedom. Um, so the point is that the difference, to go back to your first question about labor and work, both in our laboring, which seeks happiness, and in our free time, which we gain through our labor, where we do hobbies, we seek happiness. And what we don't seek is to engage in a public world with others who are different from us and to encounter people who are different and to um, engage in what she considers to be uh, the highest activity of the Vita Activa, uh, which is action or uh, politics or yeah, pl based yeah. on plurality. Yeah. No, I get that. I just think there's a balance there. I, I, I completely, I completely understand, and I do engage publicly. But again, sometimes, you yeah, you know, you know, sometimes in her reading, it's like, oh, you either do hobbies or you're like this political activist. Well, you know, that's not the reality of most of our lives, right? We, most of us, have some mix between the two because I think the individuality of private hobbies is something that gives us perhaps in our private realm some strength to go out and engage with the public realm. That's a, that, as she says, and that takes courage and it takes energy. So it's, for me, there's a recharging in the private that hopefully will, 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 will also give you the energy to engage in the public. I, I think that's my only reading of her. Absolutely. So, and she, yeah. as you know, she's a huge proponent of the private sphere. Yeah, uh, she thinks we need it. Um, she just thinks that uh, in in elevating labor, it's really not the private sphere; it's the social sphere, and it's actually doing away with, in her mind, both the private and the public sphere. Yeah, interesting. I think I just have to kind of keep where she's coming from in mind, and then it, it does it contextually. It makes it does make sense within her within her uh, within her uh, her her ideas. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, good discussion. Uh, Bill, you're up. Hi, Bill. You got to unmute. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, hey, Susan. Uh, I'd like to fight with you a love if you want to, but I don't know if we have time. Um, I feel this is, Roger, I'm really struggling to be a productive member of this call. I'm struggling to stay interested in Hannah Arendt's writing about the world. I cannot believe, I see some of the chat, people are talking about things like racial wealth gap and so on. How in the fuck did we get to the point that we're talking about labor equals gardening? Unless you're talking about the people who are, who are, who are uh, Ill, quote, illegal, who are paid to do the gardening, right? How, can we, how in the fuck do we get to talking about laboring as something that is not about necessities, which is what she said. I come from people, and I'm sorry to play that card, but I am from the underclass. And I wish we had those people on the phone. We work for 12 cents, 100 pounds of potatoes, 12 cents. Has anyone done that before? I'm sure some of you have, or your parents did. That's the labor I thought that we were talking about. And that's serious business. And there yeah. are people yeah, I, right now, people who are starving, yeah. yeah, and and, yeah, yeah. and Bill, Bill, just I'm going to interrupt you, and then let me let you continue. I, I, you're right about that, right? And I think this brings up an important point that we are bringing our own sense of definitions of labor to this. But you're you're absolutely right in your interpretation of a different type of labor. I am well. well no, thank you, no, thank you, no, I would no say argument. We, no, no this argument. Call, this call would be more relevant to people like me, Roger, if we could adjust it. You've used the word our bourgeois such and such several times today. Uh, you know, I, I, my, I work to be bourgeois. I have people right now who are in prison, people who are on welfare. Who in the hell is on this call? And what does Hannah Arendt have to say to them? Think what we are doing, she says. Who are we on this call? 
I'm sorry, folks, let's get, let, can we turn the heat up? Can we get past this? That I know I'm looking at my other, who is free on a Friday afternoon at five o'clock to be sitting and talking about this woman's writings in the 1950s. Already, I'm making a lie of my own irateness. But Roger, I wanna care about this. I don't care what she's saying if this is what it's about. This analysis is the best that she can do. The most interesting thing I found this week was when she talked about the sensuality of pain. And I don't know if she, what she really knows about sadomasochism, pain and pleasure. What does she know about, uh, about what fucking is? What does she know about sex work? What does she, where is that reflected? You know, the language, uh, okay, enough, enough. I, I, I'm gonna be quiet, I think it's very clear. Turn the heat up, let's get real. Let's speak outside of our bubble. Thanks. Uh, I, I hear that, Bill. Um, I don't think she has much to say about sex. I don't. Um, but what, what do we have to say? I think it's What fair. do we know? We know things that she doesn't know. I think it's a fair question. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of heat in these, in these, in these pages that we've read today, but the heat what is it a critic criticism of? It's a criticism of um, uh, uh, I mean on, on one level, it's definitely a criticism of the bourgeoisie, right? Uh, insofar as they take over politics and make politics about uh, uh, enabling the conditions of the bourgeoisie to pursue, uh, their happiness and their life uh, without um, uh, engaging in more meaningful and, and bigger questions. Questions that could be about uh, um, uh, great art or great works, but also could be about justice, right? I mean, I think that's exactly what she's saying we don't do. Um, we, we don't uh, worry about that. And what she's saying is we glorify labor. We make it so that everyone thinks labor is good. And yet labor was actually something and is something that should not be uh, uh, the be all and end all. And that labor sucks. I mean, that's what she's saying is we've we've created a world, in fact, a Marxist world in which on the one hand, Marx says we need to be free from labor. But on the other hand, Marx says that labor is, you know, the glory of man. Um, and and I think, uh, you know, what she's certainly rebelling against that um, fundamental contradiction in Marx. Now, what do we do with it? Um, uh, you know, from, uh, I think, you know, from the, from the, from some of the concerns you're raising, um, I think from her point of view, uh, we need to, um, you know, I, I, that's an excellent question. I, we, I mean, she wants us to be aware and to think through uh, our, our, our sort of the way in which uh, we have turned uh, away from property into this sort of appropriation. Now, who cares? Is this, is this like, is this like some 1950 thing that doesn't matter? I think she thinks it matters a lot. And I think she thinks it matters a lot for you know, uh, poor people. She thinks, as Susan said, poor people need a place. They need a place in the world. They need something that's their own. And this turn to labor power where we say you can sell your labor and therefore you're free because you can sell your labor, but you may not have a house and you may not have a, a place to with any privacy and you may be subject to complete bureaucratization and forms and and government agencies and private corporate agencies. I mean, that's what I think she's making us aware of. Um, uh, I mean, if we, if we think about the fact of how few of us have a place we can escape to where we are um, outside the surveillance of corporate and government bureaucracies, that's, I think, part of what she's making us aware of. Um, you know, uh, on the question of, of hobbies and gardening and, and, and stuff like that. What she's saying is our entire system of labor is geared towards 
having us have time to garden and, you know, uh, do things like that. It's not geared towards having us have time so we can go and argue for a more just distribution of, of education and housing. I, yeah, I think but just because we garden doesn't mean we I'm do, not, don't gardening do those is not, things. <laughs> I'm sorry, Susan. We're just using gardening as, a, as an example. It was, a, it was an example, guys. I, you know, I, you know, but, okay. but I'll use one of mine. Going, you know, that's, that's okay. Going, that's okay. Going skiing, or watching a movie, <laughs> or, or or working out. Right. I mean, look at the workout culture that we all have. Right. We have this incredible culture of keeping our bodies again. You know, against time and against decay. Yeah. Uh, which I'm part of, and I fundamentally admit it. Um, it's a hobby, and it. It, and it's and it's in ways it's a hobby that's geared towards preventing what's natural, which is that we're all going to decay and die. Um, but it's there, and 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 what she's saying is, you know, when, to the extent we labor and have free time, we spend our time on these sort of bourgeois pursuits, not on the pursuits of things that I think she thinks matter. Um, you know, Bill. Then it comes a question of what matters. Right? What do you What do you think matters? What does Susan think matters? What I think matters, and that's when we should get together and talk about them. Um, and I, we and should, I, we should do more than get together and talk about them. As I said in my notes to the chat today, because I'm being a very good boy today, right? I said that the uh, what about the common world? Is the common the, the the Earth? We're losing the world. The Earth is sick, ill. So we're going to get together on the floor of Congress and, make, and pass a bill. Is that what we're talking about? We're going to get to meet in these community groups and talk about this. Yeah, I, I'm not. There's something about the agora. Is that what the term is in her in her mind? I know we said she's 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 free of the of the ancients, that, but I don't think she is. There's this place where where great thoughts and great deeds are done, where we come together, when we're just trying to understand how we're going to survive. I just I think Hannah Arendt is what Hannah Arendt. I am challenging you, and I'm challenging us. Is she really able to lead us anymore? Is she I, really I, able? Is she able to? No, she's not. No. She doesn't have the correct nutrients or the correct experience. It seems like something like a hobby to read her. Mm. Enough said. I, that's all I have to say. Yeah. No, that's a that's a that's an important point. I don't think she's you know our leader. <laughs> Uh, and I would, no. because I mean, I don't think she, I don't think she ever wanted to be anyone's leader. I don't think she wanted to be a leader in 1958 when she published this book. I find Arendt uh, a spur and a provocation to thinking. Um, if all we ever did is read Hannah Arendt, it would be a hobby. You're absolutely right. Um, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and that, you know, nothing wrong with hobbies to some degree, but it wouldn't be, certainly wouldn't be reading Hannah Arendt, I think in the spirit of Hannah Arendt. Um, the question is, is what, why is, re well, there's one question is why do we read her? And I said, I, I told you what I think. I think Arendt helps us see the depth of the problems in the modern age. That doesn't mean she has answers to them and doesn't mean she has all of them. But, uh, but Roger, you really think she is doing that anymore? Do you really think she's like the problems in the modern age? We have not, and I know that I sound like a broken record. She has not convinced me that she knows that she has really dealt with the question of the we and the common world. Mm -hmm. I think she's in a denial of the fact that we have never had a common world. Unless you go back to the Agora, where the people who were there with their togas on had slaves at home. I, I don't understand where's the common world, where? And I, so that's that's already, I think a little bit bullshit there. And yeah. I have to accept but, that to follow her analysis. And that's why I'm here to understand her analysis. So if you're asking like, where was there, where was there like a perfect common world? The answer is nowhere, but she would tell you that as well. Um, you know, what, what she- I didn't say even perfect. Okay, uh, okay, but a said, common Where world. was there a common world? Well. The answer to that is nowhere. Um, where what there were, you know, in her mind, uh, uh, are places in which a concern with the common world um, uh, was palpable. With a concern uh, of people like the philosophers. 
Well, no, not, not in fact, not the philosophers. I mean, she, 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 that's her whole point. Is she thinks that people like Plato and Aristotle were not concerned with the public world. She thinks people like Pericles and and um, and Thucydides were, but not not Plato and Aristotle. Um, but she thinks politicians like people like Cicero and, and Cato in Rome, and and by the way, she thinks people like Jefferson and and Hamilton and 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 others, and then Emerson and Thoreau in in in, in the United States, uh, and Tocqueville, and Martin Luther King, and, and, and James Baldwin, and, and Martin Luther uh, King, and James Baldwin. And, oh, she and, does. She, you, oh, yeah. people, she, she, I do Absolutely. not see them in her work. I don't feel the heat. Well, I, I mean, can you talk about Jefferson in one breath, and in the same other breath, talk about Martin Luther King? Did she know what Jefferson represented? The establishment, how yeah. cruel it was. Did she know? She I did. Not feel it. I don't feel it in her work. I right. Don't feel, I don't feel. So, it. Bill, I mean, we uh, for for better or worse, this book is is not a book where you're going to find that. Right. Um, you know, in her books on revolution and in her essays on the crisis of the republic, um, you're going to see a lot more King and 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 Fanon and and Jefferson and 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 you're going to see more about that, but not in in this book. And and that's. One could, and I, I, I hear you saying that's a weakness of this book, and I will say I agree with you. Um, uh, I say it's a weakness in her worldview. There are elements of the political that yeah. exist outside that that exist outside of the experience of African Americans in the twentieth century. I mean, I'm, they, that she's addressing other topics. I mean, I, I don't mean, think what I'm talking about is only African Americans, my brother. I think the majority of the people in the world have been oppressed by Western Europe, period. Yeah. I mean, that's objectively true, but that she isn't really what addressing are the truth the that we topic either. About, my brother? What, what other truth are we talking about? What other truth are we talking about? I'm so, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, she has other books on imperialism too. That's a good okay, point. Okay, but let's, let's, but, but the, what's the, the point is she would say West, the Western, the Western tradition has oppressed people. And um, that's neither good nor bad. She would say that's part of, of, of the, the history that we have to engage with. Uh, and that it's and that there was greatness that came out of it and, and terrible things that came out of it. And our job, right, is to read it today uh, and and think about it in a way that tries to hold on to what was great about it and change what was bad about it and tragic about it. Um, that I think is, 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 is why I think Arendt matters to me is that she is not because she gives me a sense of what to do and how to change things. Actually, that's not what I find in her. What I find in her is an appreciation and an insight into what was great and is important that is being lost. That's how I see RN's work mattering, at least in a book like this. In, in what's, what she is, what this book is about is the loss and the papering over of an idea of political freedom and by the way, of private uniqueness um, uh, and, 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 and the way these, this whole political tradition uh, of freedom and engagement with the common world based on a plurality is being uh, um, uh, lost and flattened. And that's uh, to me in a, a deeply, I think in that way, this is one of the most relevant books that we could read in the 21st century in 2021, because we are seeing the loss of a world of plurality and a loss of action and a loss of a common world. I mean, on the question of truth, on the question of, 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 of allowing different way, people to, to live in different ways in an economy that actually doesn't sort of force everyone into a kind of bureaucratized conformity, we are losing so much of what she thinks is important about plurality and freedom and activity. Um, Which and, I don't think, Roger, I don't think ever really existed. Okay, that's a fair claim. And what she'll say is, I mean, well, she's going to say that they existed, not, you know, in the sense that everyone had access to it, 
but in but that they were there. <laughs> is that a serious comment? <laughs> yes, it's a very serious comment, Bill. I mean, the point is they existed in ways that were not, you know, you, you don't want me to use the word perfect. They they were they were um discriminatory. I'll, I'll use that. That doesn't mean they were bad in what they were. It means that they were not uh as available to everyone as they should be. Now, maybe that was of necessity, maybe not. She doesn't think so, but she doesn't have answers about how to bring it back, but she thinks it's important for us to hold on to, uh, or to at least be aware of what we're losing if we're gonna just lose it. Um, that's, the, that's the relevance of this book. Uh, you know, I, I deeply believe this book is relevant today because um, if we don't figure out a way to talk about a common world with the we, who, whoever the we is now. And by the way, if we come up with a we now, in a hundred years, people are going to come back and say, how could you have left out this person and that person? And we, we'll have left out those people and it may be uh, you know, undocumented workers, but it may be robots or it may be uh, artificial intelligences that we left out now in constructing the we. I, I'm just just saying, maybe, who knows maybe what the a, we is an illusion, Robert. Uh, Roger, maybe the we is an illusion. Uh, you know, I think, I, 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 I think I the we. I, uh, I think the we. I, I think, something because well, this seems to be a I, I, discussion here between three people. Uh, it, Roger, may I just say something? It's Vivian. Okay, but yeah. Um, I, I think uh, I think we have a, a problem here, not with semantics but with language, not only language, English, German, but also meta language. First, I think that you have said several times in this meeting, uh, what do you think this book is about? And the last time you said it about uh, being the loss of political freedom, I, can, I think it's a very, very good assessment of what this is about. She talks about the loss of political freedom. If she's talking about anything that matters, she's talking about meaning, the meaning of life, not in the existential things, but what is meaningful, why we live. We don't just live now, I think, to labor. Now, I think that the problem, first of all, I agree with Bill in terms of his invitation to put up the heat, but not to put up the heat with arguing between ourselves, not that that is useless, but that uh, put up the heat, Roger, in critically um, um, in critically uh, downloading this text because uh, the problem started here with, and I'm sorry to say, but uh, uh, with a degradation of her terms, of her categories of labor and work. I mean, speaking, it's a, a degradation and frankly a waste of my time to attend a group where I need to learn something, to be uh, uh, degraded and talking about hobbies and gardening, that is to say non-paid labor or whatever. So I, I think that, that that was the mistake that set us on this degraded path. And I think that Arendt, and I said this before, and I think I know that it sounds funny and she's writing in a certain time, but we do have to remember where she comes from. She comes from a place herself of displacement, uh, uh, a place of uh, 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 refugee-ness, a place of annihilation in, in several different ways, including physical. And uh, I, I think that, um, that uh, that she's never actually, uh, she's rarely wrong about anything. If we think she's wrong about everything or this, that, if it's too easy to assess that she's wrong about something, I think that Arendt is like yoga. If it's too easy for you to do, you're doing it wrong. And that's what I'd like to say. So turn up the heat here with the critique. That's what I say. I Thank pre you. appreciate that. It is really, so I, I know we've, been on this for too long but just just one minute this is uh, ben holmes it is definitely like worth thinking about because i think of the like importance and kind of i don't know if it's grandeur but whatever the, the importance of the ideas that she's gesturing at like we came at this when we were talking about america too where she's talking passionately and i think very resonantly mm. about the need for a public space but is talking about it in terms of something that we had that was lost which 
you know, as we've heard testimony from in this group, if you are black or indigent or, or uh, you know, like a physical laborer, that like, it, it's clear that they're not, not thinking of you, not that she needs to think of everyone. It's, it is just like, it's incumbent on us then to think about and talk about what that means. That like the point of view that this person gesturing at the idea of a public space is because of her formulation, leaving out big swaths of people, you know, it's, it's, it's clear if you see it, it's maybe not clear. Like I wouldn't have picked that out because I'm white and middle class, I think. Um, I, I would have been like, oh yeah, a public space that we all shared that we're losing. That makes perfect sense to me. But on, on, on a little reflection, like what Bill was saying, like, yeah, that's, that is not a lived experience. And she was discussing America as having previously been this like egalitarian place where things worked because there wasn't the mass, uh, uh, you know, problem of need. That rings very strangely in the ears of, of somebody whose uh you know ancestors were slaves here it's just it's you know to get to that public place there certainly needs to be a, a motion towards people that maybe we don't see in her writing at all and that may not be a fatal flaw i just maybe that it's incumbent on us to pick up the torch but we do need to pick it up i think um, and let, let me just say to the lady who said that i'm not talking about her being wrong I'm saying she lacks the necessary nutrients and experience to be able to speak to the modern world of people that I live in, and I suspect people on this call do. She is often right, and she is great because she thinks. She knows, she teaches us how to think. But you have to realize that she does not, she doesn't have the proper nutrients to be truly the guide that she would like us to be. she ever set herself up as someone who said oh i have all the answers follow me i don't sense that in her i agree with you she lived in a different time and place totally agree completely but and the common bill that was a really good question i i, I emailed you i i texted you separately but i think that's a really good point who is this common that we're talking about well it changes all the time Right, the common changes. And even in her, she lived to 1975, yes. And so yes, experienced the 50s and the 60s and knew about the history of slavery and America's part in that. But the common continues to change. So I kind of take her on a higher level, which is this, which is kind of what Roger has said, is, is that, no, I don't look for her for specifics for a 2021 but in terms of her concepts of commonality yeah i do agree but it is up to us to figure out now with the diversity and the challenges in this world what does that commonality look like and i i that you said that bill and i completely agree but she's not going to give us the answer she gives us the concept and i believe in that concept thank you susan but it's she's but roger is saying and she is saying Think what we are doing. Think yes. together on what we are doing. Yes. There's some different problems there. Think together, first of all. Yes. We're not together. We're not together. If I'm trying well, to really talk about the world or this country the way it is, and the we, I keep saying what we are doing. And that there, there it is. That's my that's my problem. Maybe Roger with what we are doing. But the maybe lady this is, is who she is, you know. But maybe th that's right. But maybe this is not the form for it, Bill. I don't disagree with you. I, I get, I, I, I get it. I understand. I get, yeah. I, get it. For, I get it. Thank you for your indulgence. Thank but, you. But, I get but, it. People I get say it. like the common changes, but this isn't a new category of person. Like if anything, this is a, a criticism, and I think it's fine to criticize, aren't like it's not like no one could have anticipated that Black Americans that lacked a space at the common dialogue at the time that like you know it's one thing to say like in a hundred years who knows what our categories will be yeah i'm sure there'll be new categories this wasn't new it's it's a lack and maybe she didn't set out to do it you know i'm not here just to bash on her but like it's it's different than saying like oh no one could have no one could have known that black people needed to be included in an idea of a common space in 1950 or whatever like that's that that yeah, doesn't let, me, let me just say, yeah, I mean, but, RN clearly did know that. 
Um, she was very sure. aware of it. Yeah, yeah. And she, she you know, talks it, about r racism. And, and she talks Sorry. a lot about it. Of and, course she knew that. There were thousands and thousands of black and African soldiers fighting in World War II. I mean, by the way, she, she refused to give talks in the South because she didn't want to be put in a compromised position of having to be in the South. I mean, you know, sure. should she have done that or not? I don't know. But that's, you know, she was very aware of what was going on. She, she, she didn't talk about it in public for the first, you know, 10 or 12 years she was in the States because she didn't feel like she understood it well enough. But starting in the 60s, she started talk, writing and talking a lot more about it. Now, you know, we, we've read some of her works where she talks about it and we will read them again and we can talk more about it. Um, she certainly Raj, thought, you know, I think people should know the conversation that you and I had before this book started. And I told you, Roger, could you make something similar to a land acknowledgement where you say that just what people have said in this phone call today, we have to realize that this woman is coming from a certain experience. And just to put that disclaimer on what we are doing, I ask you to do that and you refuse. You said that I was somehow other uh, taking away some important uh, aspect of what she has to offer us by describing her in terms of her ethnic origins, her Europeanness, what have you. And I said, we need a disclaimer at the beginning, if not every class, that this is what we are doing. This is how you roll in a interdisciplinary and a multicultural world today. Yeah. If you really want to build a table, own what your what the point of view is and i think that we did not and there's this term now that people say centering whiteness and i know that women on this call know what i talk when i mean when i say the male gaze these things have got to be talked about regularly framing conversations we are not doing it here because we want to exist how do you say susan in some elevated level and i say such a level does not exist i do agree with that i think it would be very critically useful to contextualize this uh, repeatedly, just as if you if you decide not to smash uh, and burn a Confederate sculpture, if you decide to exhibit it somewhere, it can only be done with a commentary, with a, some kind of contextualization. So in Amen. the same way, I do agree, and I think that that would be useful, because then at least we would know what language we are speaking. I yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. This is between Roger and I had this discussion before yeah. the book began. Yeah, and, and I now, and, and it's uh, come back to bite us in the ass again. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't agree. I'm jumping in front because I always end up last, so I'm going to bring this. <laughs> I, 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 I think, for example, we're missing the great point of of Arendt. She's talking. I'm startled by her. I'm stunned by her prescience. She speaks in terms of principles, and she admonishes us to think and contextualize for ourselves. I don't know that we have to, that it's a criticism of, um, that's, that's valid to say, well, she didn't, she didn't think in terms of those, uh, those, those uh, thoughts or in that type of context. Um, today, in my mind, for example, one of the things that, we're facing a watershed moment, it seems to me, and I'll, that I speak of, and this is a global one. So t tell me, Bill, how you would how you would put it in in the context of of what I can only hear is anger. And I must tell you that um, years ago I saw you you perform magnificently at my son's school, where he's headmaster, a school of diversity in Oakland, and you stunned. The audience, the 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 students, and you changed us. But every time you come in, you're, you're confronting us here when we're talking about principles. I think of a of a global nature, and I don't think, for example, they're, they're, that's necessarily accurate. But I, but I speak of, for example, tell me about vaccine, the global world's vaccine distribution policy, and how that's going to be resolved. And where and what are going to be the metrics that are going to term, that are going to determine that? And for me, that you're 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 hearing, I hear Aaron saying there has to be a global policy or policy to discuss this most momentous issue. Are we going to say only the wealthy countries are going to have it? Is it going to be vaccine diplomacy as expressed by China? 
how are we going to how are we going to distribute to the the entire planet the need for a vaccine? There is no discussion. John, John so of... I thank you very much for actually being someone on the call who has actually seen me in my career, which is highly subjective. I make art, and I look forward to getting to the parts where she talks about what an artist does. I say art happens when something is being pushed against. Artists are not expected to be moderated. And you're right. Don't come on this call, Bill, as an artist. Come on it as a dispassionate thinker. And that's maybe where I am in the wrong place. I was saying, to be clear, let me say it one more time. She is fantastic. I love what she teaches me about thinking, what Heidegger taught her about thinking. However, let's not claim, make claims for this process that we are going through that are not there. She does not have the nutrients or the experience to really meet us where we need to be met right now, unless this conversation is about her ability to make distinctions and to do, I think, what you're trying to say. I, and I don't, I, that, that's what I want to say. I'm, I am not here to beat her up. And quite frankly, I'm, I apologize if I must about the passion you call it anger. That's an easy way you can shoot down people, particularly people of color and women, that they get out of control with anger. So John, you've got to hear yourself and your language talking to me across our difference. I apologize for any unnecessary anger or rancor, but it's also performative and there's a strategy behind don't, it, getting don't people to apologize. think differently. Don't apologize for it. I think that a, uh, a request or a call to, for contextualization, for want of a better word, is not a criticism of Hannah Arendt. And it is not to say that Arendt couldn't criticize her, uh, herself or contextualize herself. And uh, I happen to think that precisely uh, uh, she does have these nutrients that Bill speaks about. But I think that the contextualization is for us. We have to know what language we are speaking. We have to know how we are understanding her text. We have to know what we mean when we speak to one another using these words or terms. And that's what the contextualization is about. And that's it's, turning up the heat, my sister. What you just said is what I mean by turning up the heat. And that's why I agree. We need to turn up the heat, which doesn't mean arguing. It's something different. And let me say, I, 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 the reason I didn't think I, the reason I resisted this sort of overarching before every class contextualization is because I think the book and our discussion about it will contextualize it. Um, this is not a, an ideal this, is not a this, this is not a, a, a speechless monument of the Confederacy. This is a, a, a book that we are engaging with as intellectuals and reading and as political people and as passionate people and from a plurality of, of, of voices. Um, I don't think my saying Hannah Arendt is a X from 1958 is, is necessary or helpful. Um, that's my- that, that's, that's true, but uh, somehow there has to be some kind of framing that prevents the uh, because even in an ideal world uh, a framing might not be necessary but the point is we live in a world that's far from ideal and <laughs> even here in our tiny little group we are using language differently which is why i think we got off onto this wrong segue onto this wrong path of degrading uh aren't terms with speaking about gardening and and hobbies hey, oh, oh, so, vivian, so i'm gonna say vivian 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 i'm gonna vivian i'm gonna say one more, vivian vivian this is susan i'm gonna say one more thing and then i will shut up because i am offended you totally missed the gardening was an analogy for the physical laboring of all people with some Yes, is some tiring of it and all of that. So I am just going to say that. And you, you want I me to be, you, I no, 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 no. excuse me. Yeah, if no, you want me uh, to be uh, passionate, you want me to be passionate. No, no, I you and Bill no. are going to love I this. Didn't. You're going to, oh, 
I love this. Look at Bill laughing. Bring it, you bring it, Susan. Think, bring it, honey. Bring I, it. You think I, as a white woman, can't be passionate? And Don't there we miss, go. There do we go. Not, do not misinterpret what I have said. I am done. You have misinterpreted what I said. I'm yeah, I I don't think I did I misinterpret. I think that the point about I'm tired of the point about labor I am tired of the paid labor. Okay. I am tired I, of the artistic nobility of the two of you of the artists. I'm tired of it. Done. Right. Roger, may I may I say something? I'm gonna. This I'm is gonna, Mara here. Mara, Mara, I'm gonna ask at this uh, point that we go back. Yes, little, that's what I was gonna do. <laughs> to uh, the discussions of look, I, I think this has been great. I I I do and I do think this is valuable and important. Um, but I also want to let other people uh, and other issues come in as well. Um, Susan, so I I want can Susan, can I say something because I mean for me the value is like the, the the points that you can get in this book about freedom about plurality and about the value of politics and acting together and I think in the context of the conversation that have just happened I want to make only one point a very important analytical element and political element that Aaron brings is enlarging mentality. So I think that the idea of thinking from the point of view of others and enlarging mentality where she develops her idea about judgment is very much a complement to this book in terms of the conversation that just happened. This is not to do like an ultimate justification of Arendt, but also to bring you know, other theoretical elements that she proposed in order to be more, I'm gonna use this term, inclusive. Yeah, That's I, I, all. thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I'm just gonna let go back to the thing because I want to give people a chance, and um, and I thought this was a great conversation, and I got a lot out of it personally. Susan. Yeah. So I want to um, talk about the quote in the middle of page one twelve, um, where she says. The body becomes the quintessence of all property because it is the only thing one could not share even if one wanted to. Nothing in fact is less common and less communicable and therefore more seriously shielded against the visibility and audibility of the public realm. So I, I don't understand that because again, looking at slavery, uh, ownership of somebody else's body, uh, it seems to me was very much a part of history. So I'm confused about how the body can't be uh, appropriated, I guess. And the other question or comment is just that in all her talk about fertility and laboring, she doesn't seem to talk about actual labor, childbirth, women's experience that's never included. Um, and so that's just another issue that, you know, for me is, is a uh, excluding of a whole realm of existence. Uh, you're right. Um... You know, uh, um, there are a lot of realms of existence. Back on the track, sort of after the Hold on. Cat scratch. Uh, I'm just going to mute everybody, and we'll we'll uh, we'll people can unmute themselves when they need to. Um, I, you're right, Susan. She she uh, does not very much, if at all, um, talk about the experience of being a woman. By the way, she never had children, so never went through childbirth. Um, uh, there are some interesting feminist thinkers who've um, uh, written about Arendt and childbirth. One who I would highly recommend is Dawn Helpland, Helpend Herrera at, uh, at the University of Chicago. Um, she's actually a graduate student or recent graduate student, um, but she's written some wonderful and she's actually published things in the Hannah Arendt Journal, the Hannah Arendt Center Journal on Arendt and feminism and childbirth. So um, that's uh, a place to look, but, but you're right. And, and this is one of the, you know, when, when, when Bill and Vivian are saying, you know, or Bill or someone saying we should have some sort of a whatever. I mean, you know, who is she? Is she a woman? Is she man? I mean, it, it just gets too complicated from my point of view. And these are the things that 
that we should be talking about rather than me sort of trying to say, here's who Hannah Arendt is and who's here she's not. I mean, I think there's a lot of people, there was a certain feminist movement of Hannah Arendt scholars who said she's not a woman. You know, I, I a couple of years ago, I was teaching a course on, on politics and the main texts were Hannah Arendt and a colleague of mine stood up and said, you know, here Gurkowitz goes again and he's not teaching women. And I stood up and said, well, the, the main text is Hannah Arendt. And he goes, well, that's not a woman. And I said, well, you know, I mean, what do you do with that? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I understand the claim. I do. It's not like I don't get it, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm going to go there. Um, um, so, uh, our end has blind spots. There's no doubt about it. I, I, no one would ever claim she doesn't. Um, you know, the, 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 the sentence you, you quoted, uh, is on 112. Um, and it's where she's talking about the rise of society and the creation of this sort of the loss of private property and the move towards wealth and appropriation in a, in a social realm. And then she says that laboring um, is the most private of, of human activities. And, and then she says, um, as you said, that um, the body becomes the quintessence of all property in this new sense, not of, um, of, a, of, a, of a house or of, of dead property, but of living appropriation. And um, nothing, she says, in fact, is less common and less communicable and therefore more securely shielded against visibility and audibility of the public than what goes on within the confines of the body, its pleasures, pains, its laboring and consuming. Um, nothing by the same token ejects one more radically from the world than exclusive concentration on the body's life, a concentration forced upon man in slavery. So you said, well, um, slaves are owned. How is it that the body is therefore private? Well, they're owned in a private relation, um, you know, of, 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 of an economic relation. Um, but they're but but what's owned is not is 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 the labor power in some way. Um, and what she's saying is, when you own a slave, you completely um, render them invisible from the public world. By the way, you know, I didn't I didn't go into it in response to the last few questions, but that's what she says about slavery in the United States. She says the United States was able to create a realm of freedom in large part based on the great, the original sin, which was the hiding of certain groups of people, including women, black slaves and uh, Native Americans. And she says that, you know, so, you know, it's not that she ignored them. She said that the country ignored them and was able to create a meaningful realm of public freedom but did so without them. And clearly uh, she believes that that was, she, she calls it the original sin, the great tragedy. And she says that, you know, you need to actually fundamentally make an effort as she writes in the essay, um, Civil Disobedience, to bring those excluded groups back into uh, the we or the common. And she actually argues for a explicit constitutional amendment welcoming black slaves and descendants of slaves into the we of the United States. That's her, that's her solution at that point. I'm not saying it's the right solution, you know, uh, but it's there. And, uh, you know, so it's not something she ignores. Um, I, I'm not sure she has an answer to it. Just, I'm not sure anyone else has an answer to it. Um, so anyway, the point is that the body is, is private in the sense that, uh, it is, you know, it is uh, seen as a pure economic relation, and is um, uh, um, basically uh, doesn't appear in public in a meaningful way. Um, that's that's what I think these these passages are about. I mean, this this, this these passages on pain and the body, uh, where she touches on drugs and the distrust of the senses. 
and the non-worldliness of pain um, are fascinating. Uh, you know, um, uh, Elaine Scarry, uh, uh, about 30 years ago, about 20 years after Arendt, wrote a book called The Body in Pain um, about the senselessness of pain uh, and how pain does not, can't be shared and can't be public. And it's become sort of a, um, a mainstay of social and political theory. It's a great book. Um, but it's a lot of what she was saying in that book was said by our end here, but just not, you know, obviously not quite as, as, you know, she didn't write a whole book on it. She wrote a couple pages on it. Um, but I think it's, uh, uh, important pages. How? Yeah, no, it's actually a question about um, uh, Arendt's uh, discussion of kind of uh, life and her her really arguing that what we do today, what you were saying earlier, is kind of we're reduced to this situation because like we're not looking to commit great political acts or something that lasts, that we're resorting to human rights as the last utopia. I mean, that was Moyne's thesis, but in what way do you think that she would respond to, and maybe this is being provocative, to various uh, things and decisions that have been taken throughout the course of the pandemic, which have undoubtedly saved lives, but have also narrowed the space for political debate and other things too. So like some things might just be a restriction of what she called society, such as shutting down things like movie theaters, or that might even be entertainment. But on the other hand, things that have been shut down also includes various protest rights. Of course, in the US, there were still the George Floyd protests, but a bunch of other protests around the world have been restricted under the banner of uh, subtracting the coronavirus and elections have been postponed also. Yeah, I mean, I think that's right. I mean, I, you know, um, I, I'm teaching a course on, well, I'm, teach, I'm teaching a course on experts right now, which as you know, something she wrote a lot about is something I'm interested in. And uh, a fair bit of it is on the coronavirus and the, the, the way that experts have tried to, um, you know, at times take control around the world of coronavirus responses and the way many politicians either uh, position themselves as I'll do whatever the experts say, or those are stupid experts. You know, we don't listen to experts. Um, uh, I think uh, Arendt would be incredibly suspicious of the I'll do whatever the experts say approach to politics. And um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't listen to the experts, right? Experts have knowledge, uh, but it doesn't, but it does mean that um, we have to take the expert knowledge about how viruses spread and how they work and how dangerous they are and um, uh, treat them just as other citizens when we then come to the question of, well, how should we, live our lives in a meaningful way uh, amidst the pandemic. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the Italian philosopher, Giorgio Agamben, uh, who's deeply influenced by Arendt, um, got into a huge amount of hot water right at the beginning of the, of the, of the coronavirus pandemic back in March, last March, when he wrote uh, a series of essays um, saying that uh, uh, the, the Italian government shutdown uh, was uh, a kind of um, power play and, and, and quasi-totalitarian, pre-totalitarian uh, movement. Um, uh, President, former President Trump made a similar, a different claim, which is that, so Agumbin said that, you know, how can you shut down churches and funerals and not let people see their loved ones and not let's see people who are dying die with dignity. Um, he says, what kind of world are we living in where um, we're willing to sacrifice our humanity in order to, you know, potentially keep some people alive? President, Ex-President Trump said, what kind of world are we living in when in order to keep some people alive, we're going to take away people's livelihood? He has a different value than Agumbin does, right? One is economic, one is is more um, spiritual. Um, uh, 
whichever value you have, or whether you have the value of we have to save every life we can, the more human rights approach, um, Arendt would simply be of the point of the opinion, I believe, I, I never want to say exactly what I think, this is what I think she would believe, is that the argument about how to respond to the coronavirus should be on the question of values, using our knowledge from the experts about what you know, might happen, but we should be having a political discussion about you know, what's more important, life or economy, life or spirituality, life or religion, life or um, human connection and bonds. Um, and those are the kind of, of, of ways she would, she would frame the question. Nancy? Nancy Felson, are you here? You gotta unmute yourself. You're, no, you're... I know, there I am. Okay, um, I have a just a question about methodology and about categories and Hannah Arendt's categories. And what I'm wondering, I, it's just maybe it's a comment, but it seems to me that um, when we're talking about uh, labor and work and we're talking about hobbies, and this speaks to something Susan Wright was talking about, um, that it would be helpful to think about categories as in the in the way that prototype theory does, which uh, George Lakoff writes about and um, Eleanor Roche, it's, it's from some time ago, but the notion that categories, that, that members of a category may be peripheral or they may be central to that category, that there's a kind of, there are fuzzy boundaries between categories that you've got to, you know, that Hannah Arendt's using categories in order to uh, make some sense about how we think about things, but that they're not meant to be rigid containers that don't flow into one another, that there's a kind of fluidity between categories so that something which may be done uh, as a private thing that can flow into the public realm and vice versa that there's a kind of fluidity that's one comment just i don't know if you if i need feedback on it but that's i was thinking about that and my other my other question had to do with it's pretty implicit but i've been thinking about choice and in relation to the discussion of necessities there was something on the chat recently about about necessity um i'm thinking about the fact that some members of society choose to and relish their work, even if it's, whether it's contributing to the public good or whether it's earning a living, but you can, you can have that kind of activity where you're enthusiastic about and you choose to labor and perhaps uh, that's one kind of, act of realm but other people are coerced and feel they don't have a choice and i'm i'm wondering if the hannah rent's discussion of necessities relates to human choice and who has a choice and uh just if if you could i i would like a little just a clarification of that word and that kind whether that fits into this discussion thanks yeah, I mean, I see Tara has written something about this as well in the chat um, about uh, the book is about necessity and how the demands of the body of reproducing life dictate and impinge upon other forms of freedom. So that raises the question of choice as well. I think this is one of the um, more difficult and less clear and if I understand it, maybe most combative or controversial parts of Arendt's work, and uh, I, we could certainly raise some heat on it if we wanted to. Um, you know, Arendt makes a distinction in many of her books, including I think here, uh, between poverty and misery. Um, and she thinks that People can live in poverty with dignity and um, with choices and still have a meaningful life and 
uh, contribute to the world and, and engage in the world. Uh, whereas people who are miserable uh, can't. And also people who are rendered invisible can't. So refugee camps, concentration camps, slave plantation slaves, um, but also people who are so poor that they reach the level of what she calls the miserable. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, what the difference between poverty and misery is, uh, you know, is 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 a complicated and uh, I think controversial question. And I think when Arendt has been was asked at one point and later in her life when she was in Toronto at a, at a conference on her work and she was asked about like, well, you say what you say, politics, politics. Well, what is politics? And if it's not about these questions about how much we get for food or whatever, what is it about? And she said something of the sort that, you know, well, those are, well, of course, everyone should have a place to live and everyone should have enough to eat. But those are administrative questions. They're not political questions. They're not questions about you know, how we should be living and should we, you know, should we be, um, have funerals where people go to or should we have them on Zoom and things like that. That to those, so for her, the public world and the political world are about the big questions of, of what's meaningful in life. And it's just obvious to her that everyone should have enough to eat and live and, and house and not be miserable. Um, what that level is, of course, is, is widely contested. Um, but from her point of view, once your necessities are met, you can live a life of freedom or you use the word choice, but your necessities have to be met. And what those necessities are, are um, obviously controversial. I mean, if you look at Am Am Amrita Sin's work, uh, Amartya Sin's work, you know, I mean, it's all Sin's work. It's all about what are the basic minimum conditions in order to live a life. And I think he has a much more probably a much more um, vibrant sense of what those basic minimum conditions are than our end would have. But, but, uh, but I think it's an interesting debate to have. But for her, you cannot live a human life if you're struggling to meet your necessities, right? That's the point. And then the question is, what are necessities? Nick? Roger, did you have anything to say about categories that you could clarify that for me? I, I, I just took it to be a comment that was largely right. I mean, I, I don't, I've, I've talked a lot about the categories. I mean, you know, she, the categories are here simply as, um, you know, she, she thinks it's important for us to try and talk about what we mean and mean what we say. Um, uh, you know, she, if you talk about a category like labor or work, um, obviously they bleed into each other. Um, but there's a difference that she finds meaningful and worth uh, thinking about because it reminds us of what does it mean to live a meaningful life, which is partly to live a life in public and in a common world. Um, so for her, these categories are always going to be you know, or never, you should never take, you know, you should never sort of get too caught up in them. Uh, and it's going to be very hard to identify something that's pure labor, uh, you know, unless you reach the level of slavery um, uh, or close to or indentured servitude or something like that. But um, because, you know, even, even the making of a bread, piece of bread, which is the most consumable thing one could imagine, could if it's if the bread is if we say a prayer over the bread have public significance so you're never going to completely enter the world of labor and consumables and fully um uh, leave the world of of work and durables um and so these these are these are conceptual categories um you know <laughs> When I, 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 there's a lot in these chapters on, on labor that I find really fascinating, but I, you know, I, these are, th these kind of long conceptual things can be a little bit dry at times. I mean, I, I don't, what, what else do you want me to say? I mean, they're, um, you know, I think 
uh, Arendt was working things out. And um, I think there's, I think if you, I, I've tried to make the claim that, and I think I believe the claim that these are actually meaningful and important chapters in her overarching project about trying to preserve an idea of the common world and of the public world and thus of public freedom. Um, but there's a lot in them that, that sort of gets caught up in the weeds as Susan Wright said earlier. Nick. Yeah, I, I guess I, I have to start by uh, kind of uh, uh, reacting to the earlier discussions here. For, for me, I, I find this meetings that you've hosted, Roger, very helpful. In, indeed, in that uh, I, I I don't I, I quibble and and I wonder a lot about what Arendt says because I I, I don't uh, think the way she does, but I think the the way she, what that's why I like going to these forums because it gives me an idea, a a chance to walk in her shoes to think her thoughts and to make sure that I am indeed understanding her. And I find that the, before contextualizing even, the first thing we need to do as readers of her is to understand her. And then beyond that, we can all make our own judgments. In, in, in my case, I mean, the, her categorization, her, her, the nuances, like for instance, between labor and work, the difference between that or social and political, uh, these are, these are uh, nuances that, that she, makes that I don't do. I, I tend, we all tend to conflate, for instance, labor and work. Let, let me just focus on that because we, we're talking about labor here. Uh, when she talks about labor with the characteristics of that category being one of necessity, one being of attached to cyclical biological living, this is something very, very, someone would feel very much if one were living, let's say in the 19th century, 18th century, when maybe 60% of the people had livelihoods to do with agriculture. Today we live in a society where 2% are involved in agriculture and the things that we need in order to consume are being produced by the 2% and in a very mechanistic way at that and in a very uh, assembly-like way. So that, so. I myself being a knowledge worker or having been an on, I don't have that, that uh, experience, except as Susan points out, if, if I have my own garden, then, then I get, get to simulate and to feel that. So this is, so the question I'm trying to bring up is, are these distinctions, labor versus work, important for us? Are, are, they, are they really useful distinctions? I, I myself, I'm unclear about that because I may be like Mark and the other thinkers, we just conflate it, it works. But what she's forced me to do is she's forced me to think about it because she's written quite well about that distinction. And I am now forced to, to think for myself and judge for myself whether these things are of value and what I get out of them. So in, in this sense, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being, uh, uh, very much for this type of discussion. We, it, and I, I, don't, I don't think we need to be passionate about it. It's just a different way of looking. And, and uh, there's no need for, I, I don't agree with a lot of what, what she says. I know that already, uh, but I respect, and I think she's done what she, she set out to do, which is make us think, at least for me, definitely. Thank you. I, I'm glad. Um... I'll pick up on, on on one part of what you said. It's something I've been thinking about this week because I saw a, a talk uh, this week, um, as talks are on Zoom, um, uh, by a young scholar, uh, Lucas Pinheiro at the University of Chicago, which I thought was really wonderful. And um, uh, he was talking about the factory throughout the last three or 400 years. And so that included public workhouses where in England, where you know workers would be put up and live and work all in one place. It included plantations, it included colonial factories, colonial workplaces, slave plantations uh, and factories. And, 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 and looking at the way that in the one hand, um, uh, there were sort of abolitionist and capitalist 
South joined forces to oppose slavery by um, turning free blacks into wage laborers um, and giving them a sense of, of freedom. But on the other hand, in turning them into wage laborers, um, also expropriated and, and, and oppressed them in other ways. And then he ends the talk with talking about Silicon Valley um, and arguing that the factories in the new Silicon Valley uh, are their own kind of um, uh, exploitative uh, uh, scenario. Um, you know, that's, I, I, I just put that up there because, um, you know, he's trying to tell a story in which we haven't escaped and we haven't, that if you look at um, uh, laborers and workers or laborers and for the last 300 years, um, there are still some of the same kind of relations going on in, in post-industrial factories as there were in plantations as there were in pre-industrial and industrial. Um, from an Arendtian point of view, which is slightly different, um, what I would say is that, you know, the, 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 the knowledge worker, and I'll just use myself so I don't have to talk about anyone else, you know, who, who sits in their room and reads their books and types on their computers and says, oh, I don't work. But of course I do work. Um, I, and I, when people say, you know, what's my job or, you know, what do you do? You say, I, you know, I have a job, right? And, you know, there's, you, you see this a lot. People want to say, well, I do this because it's a job because I want to make believe that I'm actually working for my, my, my bread. Um, and, and if I say, oh, I just do it because I love it, I turn it somewhat into a hobby, right? And that's, that's the thing we'll talk about later in the work section. But um, I, I do think, Nick, that, uh, I, you know, when we talk about knowledge workers, we're still talking about people who are working, consuming, working, consuming. And while many of us love what we do, or say we love what we do and, and do it, um, uh, we'd probably be doing something slightly differently if we didn't have to. Um, not to say we would be just sitting in front doing nothing, but so, you know, something slightly different. We'd probably change our time a little bit. Um, and, uh, and, and what she's saying about us is that even us, sort of the, you know, at the top of the food chain, as you will, or middle of the food chain, if you're honest about it, um, uh, you know we are largely um, uh, living a life of labor, right? Most of us don't live a very public uh, life. We 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 work and we keep working and we work more than we have to to survive, so that we can consume, right? So that we can go on vacations or have nice fancy things or whatever. And we, 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 we actually put the focus of our lives on our laboring and consumption and living and fertility, not on um, freeing ourselves so that we can be meaningful in a public way, whether it's through um, a religion or politics or through uh, a community of 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 scholars or community of, of, of um, social justice advocates. Um, and so that would be, I think, her claim, if I, if I can, if that helps. Right, I, I, would, I would consider what you just said though, as, as uh, being a worker, homo faber, because you, like, like your example, you, you're producing something though that lasts, something written. I appreciate your so saying forth, that, right? But... <laughs> yeah, and, which is different from, and, and, and that's where I can, that's where the question is, are, are the, her distinctions really uh, valid and useful? Because a lot of work today, like the factory worker goes through cycles as well, like, like, like labor cycles, but they're attached to the machine. And I think he, she mentioned this in one of the chapters. So the question of that one is producing something persistent as a way of, of categorizing, is that really a, a useful way? Uh, because a lot of work, factory work is cyclical. They produce something that lasts, but there is, well, as Mark said, there's an alienation 
uh, built into that. And the only reason where you are doing it, as you pointed out, because of the necessities of our own life that we need to live and make, make a living. Uh, so again, that's why I, her, her way of looking at it, I think have some uses, allowing one to think, but it also is, uh, has some flaws. So it's yeah. up to us to, 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 to make it work. Well, you know, I mean, there's a way in which some of what intellectual workers do is is labor, and some of what we do is work. Um, you know, there's a lot of work in my field. Let's just be, talk about my field and no one else's. There's a lot of work produced that is neither consumed nor durable. It just exists in an ether that no one will ever read and no one will ever buy. And yet it's gonna be on some computer disk somewhere for eternity and never actually be um, consumed or seen. Um, why is that happening? One could give an argument of labor that you need to publish or perish, right? So that it's just part of what young academics have to do. Or you could say people want their things to be, they want to create works. They're just, they're, and they're artists in some way, but they're just not good enough artists that their work will be seen. Um, uh, but, you know, I mean, look, very few people get to have their artistic productions seen and talked about and, in, and in discussed for as long and influentially as someone like Hannah Arendt, right? I mean, there's just not that many people like that. Um, uh, I certainly don't expect that to be the case with me in any in any shape or form. No, not even close. So, um, you know, that doesn't mean what I'm doing is not a kind of artwork or, or it just may not be very good. And I'm, I made peace with that long ago. Um, you know, I try and get better, but uh, I'm not Vivian or Bill. You know, I, I don't have that talent. Uh, I wish I did. So, um, Clara, now I get my, my boost. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh, thank you, Professor Roger. And first of all, sorry, um, Professor and my dear friends, because I was late. Actually, I wasn't aware on, um, of the change of time. Uh, Here in Colombia, we don't have that, that. Sorry about that. Yes, I should have sent out a note about that, but okay. Yeah, but I'm sorry too that I missed the, your presentation and the debate. Uh, it's anyway. Gonna, it's online, so you can always go back and watch it. Yeah, but it's not the same. I, no. I like, I enjoy being here with you guys. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Um, having said that, I wonder if you already talk about the fascinating difference that Aaron makes between the reality of life and the reality of the world. She actually... Reality of, say that again, Clara, the reality of what? Clara, I think you muted yourself. Right. Yes. Okay. Say that Hello. again. The reality of what and what? Okay. The reality of life and the reality of the world. The world. She makes, yeah, she makes a difference in this chapter. She makes a difference uh, between the reality of life and the reality of the world, of the world we share. And I find that difference quite amazing. And I think it's cru crucial for understanding her later, later works, especially the articulation between labor, work, and political action. So I want to hear about that, Professor Roger, if it is possible. Yeah, I mean, so I did talk a fair bit about that. So you can maybe, if you have a chance, go back and, 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 and watch the introduction. But um, the, in, in the chapter, which is called in English, um, uh, I always, um, um, the privacy of property and wealth. In German, the translation is the destruction of dead property in favor of living appropriation. 
and um and and so the reality of of life as as you're framing it um uh, is versus the reality of the world is life would be the living appropriation and the world would be the dead property the world would be what is um the things that last as we as nick and i were just talking about um, and and her, her argument in a nutshell, Clara, is that um, the, the labor theory of property that Locke and Smith and then Marx develop um, is largely not about the real property of the world or dead property, because it's much more about the living property of appropriation and an accumulation and... Um, and uh, and consumption, and so uh, insofar as uh, labor is about accumulating and consuming, it's about a process of life that is circular. You you labor, you consume, you labor, you consume, um, and when you die, someone else keeps doing it, and we become part of a species being, or in Marx's term, a, a Gattungswesen. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, so the, 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 the real kicker of this chapter is that insofar as labor becomes the dominant way that we engage with the world and the dominant activity in which we engage in, um, we get stuck in this social private cycle and we don't uh, have an interest or the time or the effort to actually get out of it and think and talk about what is meaningful and what matters uh, in the world. And we lose a concern with a public world understood as a world of pluralistic individuals who are different and yet have to find what it is that brings them together and unites them as a we, um, as a common world. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's not an easy thing to do. And as people have said, the we is always going to exclude people and the we is always going to change um, and what that common is. But that activity of forming, unforming, criticizing, reforming, rethinking, fighting about the common and thus what matters because when you fight about the common you fight about what is it that matters to us that's what Arendt thinks is what matters to being makes us human mm -hmm. um and uh, and um you know she thinks that insofar as we um have lost dead property which gave us a space to sort of be alone and recoup so that we could enter the world of fighting about the common. Um, and we've entered this world of living appropriation. We've lost our concern with engagement with and interest in um, what makes us human, namely uh, the, dis the fight, the discussion, the engagement over what matters and is meaningful in the world. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Professor, and I agree with you. Great. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, last question goes to Robert. Me. Okay. So this is a kind of complicated question. Um, it refers first to the couple of sentences in Labor and Fertility on page 106. She says, he, meaning Marx, um, squared his theory, the theory of the modern age, this is right in the middle of the page, with the oldest and most persistent insights into the nature of labor, which according to the Hebrew as well as the classical tradition, was as intimately bound up um, with life as giving birth. And if you turn back to page 30, 
um, you see her saying towards the bottom of the only full paragraph on that page. Um, both these natural functions, the labor of men to provide nourishment and the labor of the woman in giving birth were subject to the same urgency of life. Now, she's after something in Marx, but um, this reminds you, I think, of something said by Aristotle. Think of book one, chapter 13 of the Ethics, where he says, the student of politics should know something about soul, the principle of life. And if you look elsewhere in Aristotle in the uh, treatise on soul, and again in the generation of animals, he actually has a, an argument for saying that it's the same faculty of the soul that's responsible for both nutrition and reproduction. For both what? And I suppose if you want nutrition and reproduction, so the two kinds of labor that aren't mentioned on those pages. Um, if you wanted to square Aristotle's intuition with more modern discoveries, I, I think biologically, you look at the molecular biology of conception and of um, um, <laughs> embryonic and fetal growth in the womb. But, but here she's not talking about biology. She's talking about um, some link between nutrition, growth, maintenance of the individual life on the one hand and reproduction on the other. Um, there aren't any clues to, from language here either. It, it happens to be that both types of labor are, you, are referred to um, by the same word in English. And that's also true in French, the word travail, et travail can mean in labor, but not in German. The German word for labor and, and childbirth is not Arbeit. It's something like Wehe, which means woe or pain or sorrow. So what I'm trying to get at is how does she think that Marx's <laughs> theory, the theory of the 20th century, or theory of modern times, how does he try to link those two things? What's responsible for um, the uh, maintenance of individual life on the one hand and reproduction on the other? Um, yeah, Robert, that's going to be a, a long, that's going to be a question. I'm not gonna be able to fully answer, um, right now, but it's a great question. Um, uh, I think this, I mean, this goes to the contradictions, some of the contradictions in Marx. Um, that on the one hand for him, labor is this ancient, uh, very basic, natural, classical tradition with necessity, uh, labor, childbearing, um, productivity. Um, uh, and that in childbirth, you multiply and you create worldly beings, things. Um, You're fertile. What? You're fertile. 
you're fertile exactly and so marx has this incredible fertile um almost utopian idea of labor as a kind of um be fruitful and multiply create things create the world create yourself through labor right it's, as, the, it's he, the source of everything human yeah does. and then on the other side you know labor is this dehumanizing activity that we need to be freed from um and uh you know she's she thinks that he's that you know this is not a, a weakness per se it's the part of his brilliance that he sort of has such a deep understanding of labor that he gets caught in these contradictions um but uh i'm not sure much else you know uh how much more i can say about the sort of specifics about nutrition and birth and and they are, and, and I mean, I'd have to do a lot more work to, to, to unpack some of that. Sure. Uh, as for Arendt not being a woman, um, she mentions the, the um, labor, the pain of childbirth, um, the burden of childbirth, but she doesn't say anything about um, the labor of bearing and raising children, which is has been for a long time deck specific and it, it's really I, I think you might say with a more modern look at things it, it's in a very important kind of labor it's yeah not just i think i think you're right um you know i think part of you know rn got in so much trouble when she wrote eichmann in jerusalem because of not really what she wrote, but how she wrote it, right? Um, the sort of far looking back, ironic, distant tone. And I know he's, he, he had to go, but you know, I, I sometimes wonder if, if that's part of what some people and Bill is objecting to is that tone. Um, you know, and even Susan Oberman, you know, when you said, you know, she doesn't talk about childbirth. Oh, she does, but she doesn't talk about it right not in the way that i think you would like her to talk about it um you know i uh, she's she everything for her is seen from a distance and you could say oh well then she, she doesn't bring the heat she doesn't have you know it's 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 not very meaningful what i what i i mean this is just me roger berkowitz speaking the reason i love hunter Ren is because she makes me think passionately right she makes me challenge myself constantly that's why i read her um i think of her as a very passionate thinker but a passionate thinker and she's not always passionate about the specifics and um the particularities um and either you can really identify with that and find the passion in her and it's meaningful or you can't and i don't claim she's for everyone i won't claim any of this for everyone so um but as always i am thrilled to read han Arendt with you and thank you for for doing so and remind you that we are not meeting next week we have a week off and then we will finish the chapter on labor in two weeks um uh, whatever friday that is i think friday the second or first of, of April. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and thank you all very much.